Hello, Stefan. Welcome to the show. Hi, Miriam. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I am very curious where this conversation will lead us and bring us and what radical inclusion means, mm. amongst other things. And before we get there, I always start with the same question. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator? And actually, do you? I would say I identify as a facilitator. I rarely call myself that when people ask, what do you do? Mm. Um, because I find that most people don't really understand what that means. And then, uh, and then it just becomes awkward. You have to explain. And yeah, so, so I usually talk about the, the groups I work with, um, the, the things I do with them more mm. than, more than saying I'm a facilitator, mm. uh, but it, it took me quite a while to understand that all the little different things that I'm doing, that actually at the core of it is, is facilitation. Um, so, you know, the parts you. training, parts coaching, parts consulting, uh, parts just um, the traditional workshop facilitation as a, as a skill and, 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 and task, but all sort of comes together and yeah, and, this term facilitation. So that's why I, I, after I think 15 to 20 years started to identify as a facilitator. <laughs> and I love this answer. And I, I think it's the first time I've heard that, that you would claim I identify myself as a facilitator, but I wouldn't call myself like that. And I can totally relate to the observation or the experience that people cannot really make sense of the term and then it leads to mm. confusion than anything else and yeah yeah this was actually the reason why i started with the podcast because i started calling myself a facilitator so i prepared my little pitch i'm, like, <laughs> I'm a facilitator and everyone was like what <laughs> exactly. you coach are you a consultant are you a trainer what are you yeah, and, and if you if you uh, uh, if you know people in in therapy circles, there's there are different uh, modalities of, of of alternative therapy who call themselves also facilitator, and it's sort of similar, but it's not the same. So then it it creates even more confusion. So depending on where you are, it also has certain, um, um, yeah, the, there are certain ideas attached to the word that are yeah. not necessarily what we would understand. Um, this is so true. And um, I think the most awkward situation I put myself in was um, at an ecstatic dance retreat. And people <laughs> asked me, so other participants asked me, so what do you do? And I said, I'm a facilitator. I'm like, me too. <laughs> and most exactly. of them were facilitators of either dance workshops or healing workshops exactly, um, or yes. spiritual journeys. And then to explain that, Yes, but no. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So wh what they do is very similar. It's just that yes. it's very focused on their therapeutic modality, right? Yeah. So. Um, and anyway. interestingly, they <laughs> um, they use the same flow. They usually have the same priorities. So you start by creating a safe space. Everyone gets heard and seen, and you sit in a circle a lot, and still yeah. it's so different. Yeah. Yeah. It it can be. Um, I, I'm finding that um, with in in my work at least, and with um, with the, this experience of the last uh, three years of of uh, of the pandemic, um, a lot more of this of this we need to um, accommodate what people come with is is coming in sort of the traditional workshop facilitation as well. I think people are realizing that a lot of people are on edge. Mm. Um, there's there's um, a lot of tension there that people might have been able to. I'm sure it was there to some extent before as well, but the armors were working mm. better. <laughs> um, and mm -hmm. so, um, so I'm finding this this comes in more and more that it that it becomes sort of a. It's not therapy, right? Um, what we do, but it. But but that therapeutic element of of um, um, 
welcoming in some of these things and giving space and slowing things down so people can actually calm down and be fully present with their minds as opposed to just reactive emotionally. Interesting. That's a very interesting observation. So that what I hear is that um, in our practice, we became more mindful of the circumstances um, of how participants are joining. And if I understand you correctly, that was triggered by the pandemic. And I, because for the first time, we acknowledged that everyone is facing this difficult um, situation and everyone has mm. their own way to cope with it or their own difficulties with it. So suddenly we could call it in. Is this what you mean? Yes. And it's it was okay to be called in. So I might have mm -hmm. seen this before as well, because this is, you know, that, that people come with their issues and that they come with, with whatever is going on outside isn't new, right? That's that's partly why we do check-ins and warm-ups and 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 I things to to have people settle in and and leave whatever they have as issues outside of of whatever it is that we want to focus on. Um, but I think groups started to be more more open and comfortable of of bringing these things in, um, other is than just other than just saying let's take ten minutes to arrive yeah. and have a check-in. And leave whatever isn't relevant for today outside, or yeah. tell tell each other if we are, you know, activated by something, mm -hmm. depending on the group. Um, but now all of a sudden, oh, let's have actually a little bit more space to to talk about how it's going, how people are feeling. Very in in the beginning of the pandemic, especially, um, I would, you know, a lot of face to face stuff would shift online. So all of a sudden, I would do, I would facilitate online. Uh, workshops, meetings, projects, uh, th um, project workshops, one every week almost. Um, and they started to be slower than the, the typical one because of this. They started to be a bit more um, people appreciating that there's a, there's a time to breathe and that we didn't have to get to anywhere in the, in the same time that we would usually want to get to. Yeah, wherever where it is, the group decided to go. Right. So basically, not necessarily the facilitators who became more mindful, but the participants who became more also, mindful. Yeah, um, and more open to listen to each other how they are feeling, where they're coming from, without labeling it woo woo immediately. Yes, definitely. And I think it gives me then the permission, and this is to to continue doing that. Mm, yeah. Because I realized, oh, this is actually people people welcome it in, to a certain extent and 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 they like having that. And so now, even though a lot of, you know, we, we've sort of turned back um the the dial uh, on a lot of things that that were um that we would do two years ago, dialed back to how it was before. Um but I find I've I've changed, right? I've I'm doing still things differently, um, so I'm Beautiful. looking much more at sort of the developmental processes of the group that I work with. I tend to like to work with a group more longer term as opposed to just doing one-off workshop. Um, so when I have the opportunity to choose, which obviously we all we don't always have, I'm 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 I I see how I'm drifting more to these sort of longer term developmental things uh, than before yeah. where I did a lot more of sort of one-off a workshop yeah. here and a process there and yeah and it's interesting because I started online facilitation with the pandemic or because of the pandemic so I don't have this before and after view yeah and you made me just reflect whether I have actually changed back um, and I haven't, I do realize that the groups are getting, that there, it takes more effort maybe, or may, more um, design to help the mm. participants arrive and really make yeah. the cut um, to slow down the pace because they are back in their routines and the, the high pace of before pandemic. 
not just back. I think it's 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 accumulate. So I've I've been maybe just to to back up a little. I've been doing you know work with 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 remote hybrid distributed teams uh, since two thousand nine. So I have mm -hmm. a very good view of of how that was before uh, before every worked from home for a, for a couple of years and um and i think the amount of meetings just has increased exponentially in those in those last years people didn't they, there was you know there is a there was a tendency of, of meetings augmenting of number of meetings augmenting um but not where people would have regularly i hear now people having eight hour days with eight meetings of an hour each um, and, uh, and and organizations are waking up to that. So there's more and more more organizations that are telling people schedule for 15 minutes. So you have 10 minute breaks, but it's still very much in that sort of we spend most of our day, 70, 80 percent of our day in meetings. Um, Why do you think it's there? And, oh, it's the it's it, it's it's a, it's the um immediate attention culture, maybe we mm. can call it that, um, is that uh, it's hard to shift to uh, to more of an asynchronous culture where um, where I do things on my time and the other might have to wait a little for mm -hmm. my response. So I feel obliged to respond immediately just as much as I expect the other to respond immediately. And so... Um, Oftentimes, the only way to do that is having a meeting, because then the other can't can't escape, right? Because you know we're talking now, so you have to respond to me now. Yeah. Whereas just... if I send you an email, you might ignore it for half the day, and I might have to send you a WhatsApp message say, "Hey, I sent you an email. Respond." And we so just... you generate three or four notifications around one email, whereas calling the person or saying, "Can we meet in an hour?" You know, it's just one message and then we just talk and I have my stuff resolved. Or not. And I wonder to what extent oh, yeah. <laughs> actually the illusion of productivity, right? Yeah. Um, because if we cannot resolve it, because sometimes we also need thinking time and mm. thinking together um, synchronously is difficult for some, especially if you're rather introverted or if you think to speak instead of speak to think. Yeah, and I somehow wonder whether there's also an element that um, it's difficult to for many to work alone. Mm -hmm. So if you're in an office space, then you have the accountability partners around you. So yes, you do your work; you're behind your screen, but it's a shared experience. Um, and then in the home office, it's very difficult to find this. Um, accountability within yourself so it's easier to have just a lot of meetings to enjoy this together time yeah that's a good point uh, accountability is, is probably de is definitely one that i can see as well as, mm. as very relevant yeah mm. yeah but how do we get there lots of meetings yes um yeah, so so I agree. I mean, it's not about cutting all the meetings out, um, but it's also about learning to that not everything has to happen in each. So, what's the good middle point? And for some, it might be more meetings than for others, but you know, it's not uh, it's not either or. And then just getting better at doing them, right? We, I mean, um, um, yeah, Joe Allen comes to my mind. He's a um, meeting researcher, so he's a. Mm. He's an academic doing research on meetings. And he said in an interview that the outcome of a bad meeting are more meetings. Mm, definitely, yes. Because you couldn't resolve or you couldn't discuss and then you just schedule more meetings. And that's where facilitation comes in, right? Um, that we yeah. actually need less of those. Mm -hmm. And that's how, how facilitation also becomes this crucial uh, skill for, for leaders now. What do you mean um, by that? Because um, I, I've, one of the things that I'm that 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 I'm observing um, is is a is this you know with with more and more technology or with technology enabling more and more distributed and flexible work arrangements. Um, so there's there's we are more and more part of different configurations of teams through project organization 
through matrices, etc. Um, we are se separating our time more and more in different groups that we're working with. At the same time, decision making is so that so what that what what that means is that more and more decisions are taken closer to where the action is. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the leader now isn't the, the decider anymore, but the leader is really the person, you know, communicating or, or working, helping them work with constraints. So constraints that might come from, from the outside, from the environment of the team or, um, and, and then communicating upwards, you know, whatever the results are that, that they're doing. And so they're becoming more and more the more facilitators of a, of a collaboration process rather than um, telling people what to do and deciding how things have to be done and, and what, what the, the results should look like. Yeah, so less of a manage or yeah, management, but in a different way. Yeah, right. And so, so facilitation at, you know, facilitating a meeting, a very, very simple thing, but they're also coordinating across different people and working with them as a sort of larger, larger facilitation task are two things that people really need to learn. Yeah. Um, if they're, if they're leading in such an environment and, and that environment is becoming more and more the norm, right? Yeah. And then. I like what you said about the constraints. So the mm -hmm. leader is also making sure that there are boundaries. To, so protecting the team um, from unnecessary tasks or making sure mm -hmm. that the roles and responsibilities are distributed. Yes. And also making sure that people don't do stuff that is is outside of their 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 area of mm. of of influence or control, right? So, so if 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 it's very clear that the budget is, um, you know, on some project is ten thousand, and my team member has this idea of creating bells and whistles around the project that would cost it twenty thousand, then there's a constraint that I have to tell the guy, hey, <laughs> or the or gal, um, mm. you know. You, you have a limit here. You can't go beyond. So forget about some of these additional things that might be would be really nice. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's not it's mm -hmm. not that there isn't there isn't a there's still an authority figure need uh, an authority um, needed, right? So you still need to exert authority in certain certain moments. It's not it's not the facilitator that we might be uh, who who doesn't really take any decisions, but the you know, has the group take the decisions. Mm -hmm. So I still might need to inf enforce certain things as a leader and have that sort of tr more traditional assertive leadership role. But I have to do it in a context where I facilitate longer term or shorter term processes yeah. amongst people. So I need to know when when do I, you know, use my authority and when do I step back and, and let people do it? And then the question is, does it need to be the leader's authority or can it be again this distributed um, peer responsibility or accountability where the facilitative leader could say okay this is our budget constraint um, considering every every project and bells and whistles everyone wants to blow <laughs> exactly how we as a team or you as a team can actually come to a conclusion <laughs> together Exactly. So the how can be def can yeah. be delegated to the to the team again. Yes. And Definitely. then I wonder to what extent, and since you work with leaders a lot, I wonder to what extent there is a is an impact on the ego on the ego of leaders with this shift in responsibilities. Because you said before that now organizations try decision to be taken at the lowest level so where the action is so there's more distributed decision making as well so if the leaders now turn into facilitators where people like us facilitators go like hooray finally they understand it <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> um leaders might think what the heck i thought that i'm this authoritative figure i'm taking decisions um, i'm telling people where to go and now they want me to be the person sitting in a circle and asking everyone how they feel 
<laughs> exactly. Um, the famous touchy feely. Yeah. Um, I, 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 there's, I'm sure there is, there is something, there's something like that happening. So I heard the other day, this, this, this is, um, it was a discussion around why are, why are all these executives calling their teams back into the office? And then somebody was saying, oh, it's because uh, otherwise they have no, nobody to show off their Armani suits and, and, uh, and expensive watches um, and, and show off that they're in a corner office, right? Um, so I'm sure that, that at some level that's, that's happening as well. W what I think is, is more common is that, that uh, a lot of managers, leaders, leaders, executives don't really know how to do this, this new way, right? So, so they are, they're, they're lost to the, to the point, to the extent that, that there's a, they realize then there's a new way they need to do things. They don't have necessarily the skills and abilities developed. They they don't have the experience doing it, um, and but but they also see that the other doesn't work anymore, mm. right? I get I get a lot of resist when I do my old style. I just get resistance from people, mm -hmm. and now that they are actually far away from me, it's easy for them to ignore me. Right before I could just get up and go to the desk, and then the person couldn't ignore me anymore. Now I, you know, if they're working from home, then you know, how am I going to do that? Um, if they ignore my email, they ignore my email. I can't really do anything, and because they're probably, I'm probably not the only boss. You know, new ways of of organizing. Um, they have a perfect. You know, they can just say I was I was doing stuff for the other project. I couldn't respond. Right, mm -hmm. I was meeting, and I, how am I going to, um, you know, check that? Yeah. So, so all of a sudden, my old way doesn't work anymore. I don't really know how to do do the new way yet, and I'm lost in the middle. Right, sort of this this typical sort of depression point. Yeah. <laughs> where. Uh, True, and then... so, so I think that's mm -hmm. much more the case than sort of people, you know, people uh, being. Um, sad about losing their you know status. whatever whatever feeds their ego their status yeah. yeah and yeah thank you for bringing up the example of many people now working for different or reporting to different individuals um, and leaders and i wonder then because then they cannot control without slipping into the role of a micromanager so it must be trust based, but then where is the trust coming from? Yeah, if there if there are no facilitation skills, um, or if even the definition of what a team is is becoming more fluid. And I wonder then whether the problem lies in promoting the wrong people to leaders or not equip them with the actual tools because I think what we have observed or maybe still observe is that those who have subject matter expertise and competences they get promoted into leadership position mm -hmm. but this is exactly where they don't need necessarily exactly. the subject matter expertise but all these other competencies so are organizations then promoting the wrong people? I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't, I would, I wouldn't uh, go as far as as judging that all organizations are promoting always the wrong people. But I, I, I think this this pattern that you that you describe is 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 definitely true. Is that you you become you're an expert in your area, so you become visible and known in your market, and therefore you you hold sort of this this authority that then makes you become a you know the the prime candidate for for mm -hmm. manager let's say um i do think that a lot of organizations have have realized that or even um you know not just recently but um that's why you have all these leadership programs um mm -hmm. in uh, in in most companies whether they are effective or not is is another story and i think what what happened uh what happened until about maybe five, six years ago, is that even though 
they were taught in leadership trainings and management trainings that they needed to do th- that they needed to lead differently the other the old model was still working mm-hmm. right the the micromanager model was still working to some extent because the people were in the office together they couldn't really run away so they just had to endure the boss the way he was and and in, the results were right so nobody really cared now we're now we're looking at a at a, at a situation where things are so distributed and so uh, networked that the, that that model just doesn't work anymore uh, for a lot of leaders it's still and, and unfortunately it still works for for many that's why it still persists but for more and more people it just doesn't work anymore and uh, and now all of a sudden all these lessons that that uh, leadership gurus have been, have been telling the world for you know 30 years this is not new right group dynamics is from the 60s or something um yeah we we collectively realize now we need to actually do it yeah um because if we don't people just uh people just disappear into distance right yeah um and um and i i think you you've I wanted to comment on one thing that you said that you said earlier is that um, uh, you you know the only way is micromanagement, but um, and the other the other thing is is trust. Is this how do we actually build connection mm-hmm. um, in this in this new world? Um, and and I think that's that's a very crucial question beyond sort of having facilitation abilities and skills. Is 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 this interpersonal um, being able to build build and maintain relationships? It's becoming really really. So uh, how can we key, the key? Well, it's it's uh, it it's very much. It, I think it goes a little bit to 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 what I mentioned in the beginning. What we talked a little bit about in terms of um, individual needs um, and and. Um, stress factors coming into into our meetings and into our workshops and it's it's acknowledging that you know we Mm -hmm. all we all have um different contexts we're in um even more so than before because before the work context was one right everybody in the same in the same location in the same office so subject to the same weather subject to the same uh, traffic jams um subject to the same good or bad food of the cafeteria um so so the only things that were creeping in was i have you know issues at home or um uh my kids sick or whatever um but other than that we're in the same little world and now all of a sudden we're not anymore um um you know we're in all these different locations so every so the the individual experience is becoming so much more um, diverse, yeah. or the the sum of the individual experiences is becoming so much more diverse. Um, yeah, and then it starts with acknowledging that the individual experience matters for the collective experience and the outcome of a group exactly. conversation. Yes. So 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 when we when we facilitate with my colleagues when we facilitate. Um, um team development processes for for remote teams we always start at sort of an individual reflection what works what doesn't work for me how is my context um what can be expected from me in what situation how am i available how how do i like to communicate is it more in writing more in more in talking um what stress is how do i react to stress how can people tell when i'm on the edge right um and when maybe they should uh, they should be aware of you know whatever's going on. Um, it 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 has to start there, but then it can't stop there. Obviously, because if we if we stop at you know this is my reality now everybody has to do what I like, we're never going to get to anywhere because probably these these interests are going to shock right. Yeah. Um, if I want to do everything in writing and you want to do everything in talking, there we have a problem. Mm-hmm. And we need to find an agreement. <laughs> um, so yeah, so start from what is it that that works? What is it that works for me best? But then facilitate a conversation to try and find agreement of what could work as a group. Yeah, just as in every relationship. 
exactly um and and i think and that and that process already teaches how to build connection and and yeah. and uh and and deepen it over time because it shows you how you know when you engage in these conversation all of a sudden you see it's not set in stone and that people are flexible and there is an understanding that certain things are more difficult than others so you know this person has a has a situation where they can't really adapt so i can adapt yeah um and isn't it funny that the moment we enable participants team members to glimpse into each other's humanity mm. so the vulnerability of just being a normal human being suddenly opens <laughs> up opportunities to find agreement and to meet mm -hmm. at a different level where in the beginning everyone says i want everything in writing i want everything in real time no 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 and then i loved what you said where you explore how do i react when i'm stressed how does it manifest what do what do mm -hmm. we see from each other in different situations this i think opens the box to realize, oh, we all have these bad days. Yeah. And we all have our, our ways of dealing with those bad mm -hmm. days, right? Some some people just shut down and 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 retreat and other people just start attacking, right? They'll be they'll become really aggressive. And so so knowing or and others might try to please. So, you know, let me just make everything harmonious so that mm -hmm. that awkward feeling <laughs> goes away. And and so knowing some of these patterns really helps you to first understand, okay, ah, oh, this person is now in there, you know, they're 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 clearly stressed. And maybe I can I can tell them, hey, you know, it's not that important. Let's meet again next week or let's let's uh have a think about it. Um, um but I also don't have to become reactive just because they've become reactive, right? It's almost very like often, a shared experience. Very often your, your stress triggers mine, right? Yes. Yeah. Because uh, we take so it personally. It's... Yeah, Because exactly. if you're stressed and then maybe you're either you withdraw. Mm -hmm. So you're the kind of person who doesn't speak because you're stressed. And mm -hmm. then I take it personally. I think you're, <laughs> you withdraw from me. So I yeah. might have these um, anxiety attacks that I did something wrong. And exactly. once we, we have clarity or transparency about that, uh, we can discuss it and actually find solutions. Yeah. Yeah, making the implicit explicit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's exactly. Nice. And so, and so, uh, and but obviously that doesn't, you know, it's not that like you, you make a list of everything because very often people aren't even aware of some of these things for themselves. So it's, 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 again, it's a process that, that can take, so you start with some simple things of that people are aware of. Um, oh yeah, I really like, I really prefer to start with a big picture as opposed to the details where some, somebody else might say, no, give me ex all the details. Cause you know, um, that really helps me, or I like writing as opposed to talking or whatever. Um, and then, and then you, you help them repeat that and go deeper and deeper as they as they go um and how do time. you how do you help teams remote teams then to work better together if you have these extreme differences and preferences because at the end of the day there's no there's no right or wrong here it's not like taking a team decision on the strategy where then everyone has to align it's if I do need this to work at my best, how do I find a compromise across the team? How do you facilitate this process? Maybe I have a hack. Not really. So, um, I mean, a lot of facilitation models use this sort of, you know, you yeah, let people think alone, have them interact in, in small, more intimate groups, and then bring everybody together. So we call, we call that me, we, us. I think there's, there's, tons of different variations of this and and that same process can can be used here so me would be what is it that works for me having helping people reflect on on their preferences etc and then in the in the in the we part so where you have you, you just have different configurations of people sharing mm -hmm. uh, and trying to and starting to understand where where is there actually a problem 
where is there actually the need for an agreement? Because a lot of these things, um, people are more or less aligned, right? I mean, they've been working together already. They they know how it, it's working to some extent. Mm -hmm. So the, the first part is to identify where is it that actually the the issue is. Um, mm -hmm. uh, where where does the does the shoe? How do you say how, how do you say that in English? The pebble yeah, in the shoe. German. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The shoe trick. Exactly. Um, and so so um, uh, so so that's the first step. And then once you have identified them, identified them, um, it's it's also not to find a solution for ev ev that then everyone has to follow. So so th th that's why. I, I think the team level is so crucial and is to understand what is actually the team. Because um, very often we talk about teams and we talk about everyone from HR, 40, 50 people in a global company. And now all of a sudden they have to do everything the same way, even though that um, I don't interact with 35 of those 40 people, right? I only interact with five of them. Um, so I actually only need an agreement with those five that I'm that I'm working with daily. Um, um, if I'm if I'm working on payroll, I don't necessarily need to um, need to uh, have an agreement with somebody who coordinates trainings mm -hmm. in the company, right? Because so the there's very step, little yeah. interaction, uh, and so and so it's 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 really figuring out. In the day to day, where does it? Where does it? Uh, where is the machine clogged, and how can we? And 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 then, what what are the people that I ne actually need to have agreements with? So so this can be very. This can can be a very decentralized process as well, where you you don't need to have now for everyone. This has to be this way, but this group does it one way, the other group does it another. Um, this group has more meetings than that group, because you know this, those are the types of people. And usually the cultures are, you know, it's not that we're that we're working in a void, right? Very rarely are we are we doing this kind of stuff in a new meeting where there's no experience whatsoever, where there's no context that people have been exposed to before. Um, I've actually never had that. So even if it's a new team, they are in an in an established organization where there is a culture. So there are certain things that they're already doing. Mm -hmm. In this, in a similar way, right? Um, yeah. So, so, so in practice, actually, just facilitating those conversations is is often enough. They'll they'll figure it out. It's like yeah. trust the process, right? I love that. Um, <laughs> and trust that they know what they are doing, and they they know exactly. what they need. And then it's exactly. just removing some obstacles and giving them the right prompt. And the second part to it is making sure that they review whatever the, whatever is that they agreed on, mm -hmm. right? So, so building in sort of a learning element over time is just, you know, it's, this is not something that's set in stone. I think people can can relax into into a, an agreement that um, may not be the ideal for them if they know it's just for a month and then we'll review it. And if it's really that bad that I fear it, it it'll be, then I can say this is bad. We need to change it. Yeah. Right. So, I, won I wonder whether how easy or difficult it is for teams to adopt the mindset of good enough, because that's what I hear. Right. So mm. this agreement is good enough for now. Let's roll with it. I in in practice, I think they've, it's very easy for them because. Usually the trouble is getting them to spend the time to actually have those discussions in the mm. first place. Yeah. Because oftentimes they will just say, I, it'll, it, it works sort of, you know, half the people are unhappy, but it works. <laughs> um, <laughs> so why, you know, why do we spend this time having conversation, thinking about, you know, nobody likes individual reflections anyway, right? I have to what? think about myself. <laughs> eh. yeah. um, and so, so there's, I mean, you know, even, those of us who love, you know, sort of self self development, etc. I I know I have resistance when somebody comes and says, "Now do this exercise." You know, the the parts of me that don't want to change, they come up and they say, "Don't," you know, procrastinate on it. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so so it's normal that those those you know that that happens. Um, and and so the resistance I find is much more in in getting people to actually spend the time, invest the time mm -hmm. in 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 this initial process. Rather than 
you know, working out, uh, agreeing to something that might not be ideal. And because there is no ideal, right? I mean, we're talking about different interests. So bringing different interests together, if I'm trying to please everyone, I'm probably not going to get a very good result. And I, I also see how difficult it is to help them understand the benefits because this rather simple exercise, which takes what, maybe an hour, rather two hours, how much impact in terms of time saved, misalignment, conflict, all of these small hurdles and obstacles that accumulate over time and teamwork, they will all dissolve as a direct um, result of this activity. But how can you help a team imagine the outcome? <laughs> good, good question. For me, that's one of the biggest challenges is to is to you know as as the, as a person looking at it from the outside, it's always much easier to see the potential, right? Because mm. you're not tainted by how things are do are, are being done right now. Um, there's no routines there for me when I look at what they're doing. Um, but for them, it's habitual, right? So it's really hard not to do how they're doing it right now. And so so I find that's the, the most difficult part, partly in, in, in remote work. It, it's, that's one of the things that I think has shifted in the last few years is what uh, in the last couple of years is what we always faced is that people didn't really have a notion of what was possible mm -hmm. remotely. Because basically, what, what they were doing is they were using Zoom or Teams as a as a as a better phone service, right? Mm -hmm. They were doing conference calls with video or and chat, and that's it. Um, but very few would experiment with all the other things you can do in there, right? Or or at, or you know, forget about adding another tool and having something visual and have one a whiteboard or something mm -hmm. like that. So that's changed. Um, Uh, thanks to thanks to the the work from home experiment, um, is people realize that you're just just doing conference calls isn't isn't really enough, and we can we can experiment with with the possibilities we have, but there's still there's still a lack of um, of really knowing what's possible in part, and then and then there's this sort of ah but now I have to I have to learn how to do this differently and I have to have sort of discipline of not falling back into my old habits and and so so it's it yeah that that's where the I think the biggest challenge is mm -hmm. I find as a as a person facilitating these processes for for teams yeah uh, and also the human perhaps. capacity to imagine that someone is able to change and the impact this mm -hmm. can have Yeah. Because I think if you're always running in the same in the same conflict or you're annoyed by a colleague, yeah, but they're always so focused on the details and they always speak so much, then mm. not being able to envision or to visualize how it could be different. Yeah, yeah, I, I can see that as well. As I almost think that the the wider context that we live in is this sort of ah, nothing's going to change anyway. Yeah. Are we doing all these things to become more sustainable? It's not going to change anyway. Um, where, you know, um, all this tech, um, we're using all this tech, but in the end, they're calling me back to the office. Eh. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, they're, they're, it's sort of almost like a, like a, a, the collective energy is also not believing that things can, can be mm. better. At least not on the micro level. It um no. it reminds me of this saying that uh, we tend to underestimate what we can do in a year and ten years, and we overestimate mm -hmm. what we can do in a day or an hour. Yes, and I have the impression that the same is true with change. We underestimate what can actually change on the micro level. and we mm -hmm. might overestimate what can change on the macro level. So now everything. Yeah. Everyone speaking of AI and what AI will be able to do, but totally neglecting what we are able to do on the very small level of the team. 
and also even even uh, imagining that we have agency in this, right? Mm -hmm. So so I think AI is a great example of where where basically the main story that we read about every day and that that is told and retold is that's the future, um, and this is how it's going to be. Why? You know, mm. Why does it have to be that way? Why can't we imagine how we would like to use this this technology and shape it to, you know, how 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 we want it to help us? Yeah. Um, as opposed to, as opposed to accepting that you know these twenty professions are going to go away and uh, and um, we're we're basically going to be, um, you know giving an idea to AI and then AI does the rest is sort of, is sort of what, what, uh, what I understand the, the current uh, story to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then again, facilitation comes into the game to help them imagine because um, yes. I listened to a podcast recently and I loved what was it Naval? I'm not sure what they were saying about, we cannot imagine what future professions will emerge. So yeah. five years ago or 10 years ago, nobody would have ever thought that um, playing video games can be a profession right? <laughs> or <Yeah>. commenting, <laughs> commenting on, on people who play video games live would be a profession. Yeah. Um, just like like the the dread of every parent from 50 years ago was was for the kid to say i'm going to be an artist now i think uh, parents are i'm going to be a gamer and they go oh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah. so um i think it's very it's easy to complain or to say oh all our jobs will disappear um but it's very difficult or it can be exciting to think what what kind of jobs will appear yeah yeah, no, I, I fully agree that 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 facilitation and and you know um, us as the people um, promoting and doing facilitation have a have a huge job in in helping people imagine that some other things are are possible, um, and that they have agency, as you said, and that they have agency exactly that they can actually something that they want to create and 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 actually do create it that it's not in vain to imagine something and yeah. I, what i just realized is um i think many of us facilitators underestimate this impact this um to empower enable this change of perspective of recognizing mm -hmm. acknowledging agency and what kind of energy boost this can actually bring to an organization. Yes. yes. Your companies, I would like, I would shift the conversation into sure. a slightly different, mm -hmm. if that's Go ahead. It. Yeah. Um, your company's name is called is Radical Inclusion. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Um, I think in the beginning it was it was two things. When we came up with the name, it was a cool name, um, and it was an expression of the things that we as a group value. Um, so so to to make a statement of saying you know um, including as as many people as possible in a in a decision in a process is beneficial mm. um not everybody and their dog but um but the people who are affected by a certain process or decision um um and who can affect a certain process and decision and an implicit in that is is this is this agency discussion right is that there's a balance of um there's a balance of um of power to 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 ha to be ha or a re-equilibrium of power that, mm. that has to happen. So it's not the 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 uh, the usual suspects who decide something, but it's it's a wider group who has to actually uh, engage with one another. And I think we're back to mm -hmm. this to this process of 
of how do you how do you facilitate agreements on a on a team level? It's 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 a very similar process. So before, the um, you know, at the company level or at the the team lead level, somebody would say, "This is how we do it." In period, mm -hmm. and now we're saying, you know, maybe you need to understand where your people are coming from and have them decide together with you, obviously, but not just you. How, how to do it so so for me that's the expression of of uh, that's what radical inclusion stands for at the same time um we were talking about you know how 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 my facilitation processes are becoming more and more um or i'm becoming more and more aware of what individuals are bringing to the process so this this whole um, diversity, inclusion, equity discussion is 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 coming more and more into into my field of awareness and and how it shapes how I work, um, and at, and so so interestingly, radical inclusion is is a is a term that that would um, would very easily also. Um, that, that very very well fits in that as well, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, even though it, you know it was really more about how can we create processes where as many of the people who who need to be involved are, can be heard. So very much from a sort of open space um, mm. system in the room type point of view, yeah. right? What's the system and who has to be in the room for this to be a long lasting inclusive um, decision that this group is going to, or this process is going to take. Yeah, because if the people who are affected are not included in the process, it won't be sustainable. Very as often, yes, very often. Yeah. So, and before coming to the um, diversity, equity, inclusion part, because I think that's <laughs> also very interesting, um, what makes inclusion then radical? Or what's the radical part? Or is it just a provocation? I think it's more of a provocation. Yes, mm -hmm. it's 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 not that you have again. I don't think it's that you have to include everyone in, in everything. Um, it's also not feasible, right? Um, so just like I said, yeah, also exactly. So so just like I said before, if you if you are facilitating an agreement among people, how are we going to be available for one another in in our little remote team? It's the five people who work together daily that are affected and that that need to have this conversation together, and not um, the parallel team who might, you know, want to do mm. things differently. Um, there might be a point of of sharing then afterwards yeah. uh, of how how our others are doing it, so we can learn from it, and that's another level of inclusivity, I guess. But but yeah, so radical is really more of a of a provocation to what's normal now mm, yeah because i as you just uh, spoke i was wondering whether radical exclusion could fit as well because if if we think of this core team of five instead of mm. the entire group of hr then mm -hmm. yes it's radical inclusion when you look at the team of five and when you look at the entire hr department it's a radical exclusion yeah which is highly effective. <laughs> yeah, probably. It, it's similar to prioritization, right? It's it's mm. uh, saying no becomes a really important thing <laughs> yes. to, yeah. to be able to do because uh, otherwise you're not going to be able to focus at all. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and then the to have the conversation, actually, and I, I loved what you said um, in the earlier part of our conversation about the team and the group. So who's actually part of the core team and I wonder to what extent many challenges or problems on the team level actually happen because nobody has ever sat down to define what the team is, especially in this world that you described where people might report to different leaders and work with different teams. Yes. And then to set the boundary and say, okay, this is the team and this is not the team. Right. Yeah. And, and I think traditionally it, it was normal to be part of a team and the team was sort of a standing long-term team that was together for several years, obviously with the turnover that you have in any company, but you would work with the same colleagues over, over a period of time and you would basically exclusively work with them. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so this is becoming more and more fuzzy. Um, um, to the point that I think a lot of people aren't really in any stable teams anymore. Um, so they might have a couple of people they, they interact with a lot um, because they're in the same project, they end up in the same projects or whatever, but it's not, they, they don't sort of this traditional de um, uh, definition of a team that works towards a, a joint goal, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that has sort of this regular interaction, which then makes it, makes it worthwhile investing in team development, team building, and all these kinds of things because they pay off over, over time. Mm -hmm. And now a lot of times I'm in this project, you know, two, three month project, especially agile organizations, I think are very fluid in that. Um, and the, you know, the, the question then is, is it actually worth spending a few hours in the beginning to align when, you know, in a month we have to do it again? Um, so that's actually one of the arguments that that's coming up quite a bit um, when we're talking about how can we become better as teams mm. uh, or as, as groups of people working together, maybe we should call it that. Um, to what extent is this fuzziness um, undermining sort of a long-term long, long efficiency or effectiveness? And it's two things come to my mind. One is the concept of slowing down to speed up. So slowing down in the beginning to actually becoming a team then speeds up everything that comes after. Yeah. And the the other thing that comes to my mind are teams that um, in emergency situations, mm -hmm. um, if there is a, um, yeah, if there's an emergency and then you have these teams of experts um, in a crisis. Um, and I would think that they do do some work to becoming a team in the beginning so that they can actually leverage each other and be fast, effective in communication. Yes. I mean, I think part of it is also in, in organizations that, that, that have that a lot, there's also standardization, right? So, mm. so I know that there's a certain way of doing things when I come into these situations. Um, um, and I think another, and there is certainly work on, on figuring out how this, you know, the, the typical team development cycle applies there as well, where there's a sort of forming phase where we try to figure out how we, how we do things together and there'll, and there'll be clashes where things aren't working. And so we're working them out through, mm -hmm. through constructive conflict, et cetera. Um, but I also think, and then, and I think we've seen that in the beginning of, of, of the, of the lockdowns as well, is that um, we compartmentalize, right? So the, the stuff that isn't really ideal, mm -hmm. we just put to the side and say, ah, for a couple of weeks, it'll be fine. And I'll just accept it. And I'll mm -hmm. put on my armor and I'll, and I'll do it the way that everybody does it because we don't have time to discuss this now. Um, and so that's part of this, of this um, emotional reactivity seeping in to work, I think, because if you have to sustain that over a long time, eventually it'll just come up. Eventually mm -hmm. I'll just be really full of resentment and annoyed and frustrated that I, you know, it's now set, it's now half a year that we're doing this and it's still really annoying and it doesn't work. And I'm, you know, done pretending it's okay. <laughs> and it's, um, this is actually a fascinating challenge because it's basically means that you have to invest time and resources in, in this continuous development or even, um, solving conflicts that aren't hot yet to avoid the wrong team then to be affected because if it if it boils up if it accumulates in me that i'm constantly exactly, exactly, frustrated yeah. for sure it will be the wrong team right, right yeah so it so this other team bothered me for three months and now i'm letting it out on you right yeah right? yeah <laughs> because yeah yeah, and then definitely. basically the continuous team development in different um, in different setups 
becomes something like a public good or a public investment, a common good that the organization has to invest in. And that's still, and I think that's, you know, letting it out on my colleagues is not nice, but for me, it's, it's still, uh, it's still healthier than eating sucking it, it up. sucking it up and just ignoring it and, and putting it inside. And I think so, so Ray, uh, you know, the, the rise in, in mental health issues, et cetera, for, for me, it, it, it very much connects to, to some of this is that, you know, we've, we've just been having to deal with a really, really frustrating situation that obviously uh, companies, you know, uh, the, the origin of which isn't, isn't, uh, isn't coming from the, from the companies. Um, but uh, some of the reactions they've had, they've had to this weren't mm -hmm. necessarily the best. So basically then to avoid um, everyone to become a pressure cooker. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then the solution is to learn how to deal with this conflict or because to let it out on, there are different ways to let it out on the, on our colleagues, right? And we can replace colleagues with partner, children, friends. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. We take it home. We take yeah. it to our friend circles. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So it, 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 it I think you know back to the the beginning of our conversation i think that that's where that's where people are starting to see the value of uh slowing slowing down um of having space to to talk about some of these things um very early on in the in the pandemic there was a great um process facilitated by this group called sy partners um I forget the name, but basically what they did is they offered a space for people to just vent and, and, uh, and be there. And, and so the, 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 um, one of the exercises in the first, in the first gathering was the great vent. So people would just put whatever it is that was frustrating them in the chat and you'd have like 900 people participating and everybody sort of putting <laughs> this person is annoying and that is happening. And, um, and you could you could literally feel how the how the tension in the group was sort of going going out you know like leaving, and so having these kinds of exercises uh, can be very therapeutic. Um, mm -hmm. um, you, you just have to do it in a way that it's not people attacking each other, right? <laughs> um, but that it's 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 giving people a um, an outlet. Um, and then, and then facilitating how, you know, how can we not let it build up again? Mm, yeah. Um, so it's yeah. not just, you know, every, every three months, we just let it all out. It's also not helpful. Right. Um, Especially because for some of the frustrations there might be, so sometimes we're just frustrated and we need to vent and yeah. other times there's a reason why we are frustrated. And then I think if, mm if we are asked to vent every three months, but nobody's actually interested in the origins or changing something about it, I think very soon the pressure cooker will explode because exactly. then it's also yes. a sign that we're not taken seriously. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so it's like you're doing a, you know, a, 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 a doing a parking lot and then never looking at it in a in a meeting right so you have this parking lot flip chart where people are putting stuff that isn't relevant to what we're discussing now and then we just ignore it and leave it there which i think not, is not the a good default, idea is yeah, the exactly. default of most of the workshops yeah how do you do what do you do with the parking lot <laughs> um you if if there's no time in the in the actual meeting then then we would task somebody to from the group to take it up and go through it and see what what has to be resolved by whom mm. to schedule you know other other processes afterwards or whatever it is but at that's the very least i think you need yeah. to do is sort of not you know not just put it there but acknowledge it's there and and und and understand you need to do something with it right yeah I and very often people will say ah yeah i put it there but it's really you know we can we don't need to, you know, the discussion sort of resolved it already. Yeah, and some it would 
So in the best of all worlds, there is time at the end. Oh, now we are finished on time before before the time. <laughs> exactly. Let's have a look at, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, at the parking lot. Um, in reality, there is never enough time. And then obviously okay. everything that we've parked wasn't relevant. Um, and I think I, I don't remember who it was. Maybe it was Thomas Lantala on, on LinkedIn who wrote an entire um, post why we shouldn't have, why we should stop having parking lots. Parking lots. This is hypocritical anyway. Yeah. Um, and I think there's some wisdom or some truth to that. And I like the the pragmatic solution of just assigning someone the role. <laughs> Well, you know, you don't, it, it also depends on the meeting. Sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes it doesn't to have a parking lot. So it's, yeah. it's not, it's, I don't, I don't think these things have to be rules. Um, but very often people will, you know, it's, it's interesting how, how uh, participants have certain things in their heads about what, what facilitation involves. Mm -hmm. And so parking lot is one of these things that everybody remembers. Um, oh God, from, you know, their, their past experiences. <laughs> And so we're not going to have a parking lot. <laughs> um, I actually hear that hear that quite often. Is so, oh, we can we can create a parking lot. Um, and uh, I wonder, sorry to interrupt. It's an image that people that's very very easy for people to uh, to remember. And I wonder whether it wouldn't make sense to, or whether the parking lot is the excuse of not saying not being able to say no. So what is it that as facilitators we cannot say, okay, this is a nice idea, but it has Not nothing now. to do with the workshop or with the reason or the purpose we are here together now. If it's yeah. important to you, bring it up bring another it. time. But exactly. that's your responsibility. It's not our shared responsibility and exactly. it's not for the parking lot. Exactly. Yes, definitely. And the other thing that I think happens a lot with it's sort of in the name of efficiency we're avoiding the, the uncomfortable discussion. Mm. So let's put it on the parking lot so we don't have to deal with it now. Which is even more dangerous. Uh, exactly. Um, and I think, I mean, that's core core facilitator business to then say, no, we're not going to put it on the parking <laughs> lot. We're going to discuss this now yeah. because it is very relevant and it is actually at the core of, uh, of what you're trying to avoid as a group. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. I, yeah. Um, and as you say, that's Definitely. core facilitation work to distinguish the relevant from the irrelevant. And and to and to, I, I really like this image of one of the one of the when I did uh, facilitation training. Um, No, it was my own my own training. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, so so when I when I when I learned to how to how to facilitate um um in the trainings that that I did it, I did with with a guy called Sam Kaner and he you know the the typical diamond model that you probably know as well divergence convergence right and mm -hmm. what he what what was uh, unique about his model at least for me at the time was that in the middle he would put what he called the grown zone. Mm. So where the integration happens, right? Where you actually, you deal with all the divergent ideas that are on the table. And he would, he would repeat over and over, make sure, you know, keep people in the grown zone as long as possible. Mm -hmm. That's your main job. You know, don't let them go the easy way and have divergence, uh, convergence too fast. Yeah. Um, because they're going to lose the ideas. They're going to not really talk about the stuff they need to talk about. There, uh, some several people are not going to be happy with the result. Um, but the the group will have the tendency to close fast because it's just uncomfortable to be in that middle zone. Yeah, the uncertainty. Um, and so when I say life, yeah. exactly, so when I say our core business is th that's what I'm referring to, right? Is mm -hmm. is keep people where they they as a group they can grow the most which is usually not a very comfortable place for them uh nor it is, nor is it for us necessarily but um, more for them yeah that's the reason why they hire us exactly
according to you, what makes a workshop fail? Mm. I'm not sure a workshop can, I mean, you can make have bad progress and go and, and, and process and, and, you know, not get anything done. Um, but aside from, from, from bad preparation, bad process that, you know, you might do without much, much experience. Um, I don't think there's a failure when you don't reach results. It's mm. really about, um, what can we learn from this, um, from from the facilitator's point of view, but as well as as the the participants' point of view is, um, so things have gone that way and we haven't reached our objective. Why is that right? Uh, mm. That that I think the 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 important thing is to have that reflection. Um, so failure would probably be not to reflect on why things haven't worked the way they did. They, mm. they did like that. They were supposed to. Yeah. 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 Um, and it, and I think it's hard as a, as a new facilitator to, to sustain that mm -hmm. because you need to sort of say, Hey, you know, there's nothing, there was nothing wrong with my facilitation. Mm -hmm. Um, the dynamic was such that, right. And, and, and get them to get the, get your client or your, or your group to reflect on that as opposed to them blaming you, which, you know, in the beginning, to me at least happened quite a bit is that uh, we didn't reach the objective. It's the fault of the facilitator. And in some instances, it's okay to be, you know, to, to, to take the blame if it helps the group. <laughs> um, but it's recognizing that, you know, it's oftentimes there was nothing you could have done differently that would have le led to a different outcome. Yeah. Because, you know, that's just the discussion they had to have. Yeah. And I thank you for the reminder also about the responsibility it's not so the the quality of the outcome and to some extent the outcome itself it's not our responsibility and then yeah, yeah. who are we to judge anyway um and that's probably the hardest sell you have to make as a facilitator right um to yourself in the beginning especially that you want to satisfy your clients so you want to reach their objectives but realizing that, you know, that's not what you're there for. Um, because otherwise you're taking away their, their agency. Yeah. We're back to, to agency. And that's difficult to sell. Because mm -hmm. everyone wants to buy certainty, wants to buy results. I and think they want to have somebody to, 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 to give the responsibility to, yeah. right? Yeah. And I guess that's why it's still easier and more expensive to sell consulting services than facilitation services. Because Especially there's if you're doing McKinsey model yes. consulting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because there's a guarantee in an outcome. You will have a slide deck with some results and three priorities that you can implement. Exactly. And then but then you're not getting involved in the implementation. So yeah. In the in the in the pure model. <laughs> exactly exactly um which somehow leads us back uh there was uh, still something that i put in a parking lot <laughs> in our <laughs> conversation um and i hope that we have time to at least touch the surface which is um the implication of dei diversity equity and inclusion in the radical inclusion inclusion model <laughs> Um, so I don't do full DEI work, so I'm, I'm not a diversity, equity, inclusion, um, specialist nor consultant. Um, I've, I've done a little bit of, of, of dipping my toe into the issues and, and as a facilitator, I think there is a certain awareness of, you know, individual differences coming in and, 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 and understanding whether, um, how how people are affected by whatever integration happens or not or doesn't mm -hmm. happen. Um, what I'm finding in especially in team development processes, um, the 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 topic of identity um, 
So um, identity as a BIPOC or as LGBTQ plus or as um, rich or poor, um, people are more outspoken uh, mm -hmm. or or more um, um, more clear about that that they hold a certain identity and what that what that means for them. So when I think before, this was just sort of a private matter that mm -hmm. that I wasn't going to share necessarily with my colleagues. Now it's it's a more it's a more uh, it's something that I take into other spheres of my life, um, um, and so it becomes 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 a topic, and um, and other things where the where the influence is more collective. I find they're becoming less relevant. So cult uh, national culture, for example, mm. is one where before you had sort of quite homogenous groups working together and then you had the odd uh, foreigner coming in, learning about, you know, uh, oh, I'm an expat in India and now I need to learn how things are, you know, how Indians communicate, et cetera, which already is a quite a thing to say Indians because, you know, regions okay. are quite different. Um but but so there there was this this um, you know I can learn about a certain national culture and how they communicate and how they understand authority and how they deal with um, time etc and that can help me be more effective and and less confrontational in 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 those contexts. But now you know most teams are multinational, multi international. Um, you have these 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 things of of individual identity coming in. You have different work preferences coming in. You have all these different contexts of somebody wants to go to the office to work uh, heads down and concentrated, and another person wants to go to the office to socialize with colleagues. Um, and so, so the the biggest lesson for me with all this uh, with all these different pieces coming in as active active influencers of how work how groups work together is that you need to start at the individual level and understand who is it that's actually here in the group and what are their preferences and how do they see the world um what are the beliefs they hold about you know certain different different things um um so what some of the most interesting discussions i've had with um with leadership teams is starting to talk about what do you actually believe about remote work? Is it better or worse? Do we get more done on in the office or less done in the office? So, so challenging these kinds of things and, and share, having them share and see how, how often there's not a unified mm -hmm. view of um, one is good, one is bad, but that they're actually having very different views on, on, on things. Even though that's not a good example for for inclusion diversity generally, these kinds of teams are very homogenous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and still it is a good example because it also a simple question, simple question like that reveals mm. then the biases and the blind spots. So we don't yes. even have to look at the the hairy things, the politically or socially more. Yeah. How do you call that? Uh, more sensitive topics mm -hmm. in order to realize that. I, I just wanted to add one more thing on the, on the diversity, inclusion, equity uh, topic. And that is that um, a lot of times when people bring these, they you know, they're they are, when, when they communicate openly their identities and, and what that means for them, they've, they're strongly attached to trauma. Mm. Um, and so a cert we talked about emotional reactivity already. Um, so in this case, it's not just stress, but it's, but it's me being triggered in, um, in a, in a collective trauma response, right? I'm, mm -hmm. I might, you know, um, a, a black colleague, um, might be reacting to a certain joke, um, in a certain way, because that just triggers, for for him, you know, a a, a racist um, it's a racist trigger, and that triggers a certain certain response from from him that the team 
needs to understand, sometimes accommodate or, or hopefully accommodate um, and and um, and figure out how to work within this group context. Yeah. And this is a very important point you're making, um, which also relates to the disclaimer you made at the beginning that you're not a specialist in the DEI work because what I understand is specializing or promoting the DEI work also means that we have to um, be specialists or at least to know how the trauma-informed facilitation style. Yeah. Yeah, pro probably, yeah. Um, probably. Yeah, it, it. I mean, it. It. You know, the 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 pie sort of grows uh, as as we get deeper into 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 the topics and um, human human um, relationships are uh, this this bottomless uh, 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 pit where you know you can always go deeper. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's. But, mm -hmm. But there, there are certain things that I think are just coming up more and more and more frequently, um, mm -hmm. and are becoming more and more defining of um, of successful teamwork um, than they used to. Yeah, and then and I so, think yeah, acknowledging the normal facilitators, yeah, need to be able to recognize those those uh, those behaviors, those patterns, and 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 probably in some cases also recognize that, you know, this goes beyond what I can, what I can actually work with. Yeah. Um, yeah so because I don't know enough about different identities or because I don't know enough about how to deal with the trauma that's coming up there. Yeah. yeah and then to acknowledge it. And I think what you mentioned to acknowledge the importance of starting at the individual level. Mm. And I think this is something that where as facilitators, there's also a lot of educative work we have to do towards clients who hire us, who often want to get to actions, to results, to the team level immediately. Um, and they forget um, how important it is and how important it became to start at the individual level. Yeah. Yeah, I I think it relates again to the to the the grown zone, right? It's it's the, it's uncomfortable to to have to deal with so much diversity, um, and so let's you know, let's just skip it. Um, I think we all we all have that tendency to. I think it's very human to, to try. Yeah. Yeah, to um, deal with someone because it's who's complex, from us. complex yeah. and messy, right? And complex and messy is always is is always difficult. And we don't understand. Mm. And I think um, until our, our generation, at least, we grew up with the golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated yourself, and then everything is fine. And nowadays, we learn that this is not enough. We need to treat people no, how they exactly. want to be treated. Right? Exactly. Um, yeah. And I think that's a big shift for many, because it's um, basically a rupture in our belief system and how we were raised. And I think um, also acknowledging that it's difficult is also okay. Um, yeah, diversity, definitely. Diversity is difficult to be confronted with other opinions. And that's where the connect. And that's where the connection is, right? This is when I can when I can look over the the rim of of my cup and and uh, and start to um, open myself to see what's in the cup of the other. That's when I when I build deeper relationships that's when i create connection and then trust results and on all of a sudden um you know we can all feel safe with one another and um and and work together so much so much yeah. better which brings us back full circle to where we started taking yeah. time to to explore everyone's reality of what is present in the moment mm -hmm have a shared human humanity yeah 
and and I think one of the things that we, we touched a little bit upon, um, but didn't really go go deeper, is this this idea of so wh how much do you invest in a in in this type of a process when the people that I'm working with aren't really the same in a month from mm -hmm. now. And I think the beauty about starting with an individual reflection is that that individual reflection serves me beyond whoever, you know, it doesn't matter who I'm working with afterwards. And, and it, it puts in a way it puts the onus or the responsibility on me to then in a new configuration of people to have the discussions with the new people based on what I've learned about myself from the reflection and from the work that I've done previously, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a facilitated process all the time, right? It can be just part of normal working together is, ah, we have a new team. Let me have a coffee with this person and understand what works for them and what doesn't. And I can share what works and what doesn't for me. And then we can figure out if we need to make any agreements to make it better. You know, so so that might actually be you know done in an hour coffee where I get to know the person a little bit better and and all of a sudden we know how to work together all also. Yeah, and I think that's also relates to what you said earlier that um, most organizations, especially those who work in an agile way, they have standards for that. Mm -hmm. So if everyone knows that, okay, if you're joining a new team or um, that these sorts of self-reflection are part of the process, then it also becomes a ritual yeah. where um, everyone speaks the same language and knows what they refer to. Refer to. It was with Lizette Southerns um, mm -hmm. that I had a conversation. She referred to the manual. So how can we mm -hmm. have a manual of ourselves, um, how we function, and share yes. this with our team members and how important it is for remote teams? The manual of me. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually a great a great image and a great tool to to use. You can put whatever questions you you think are relevant in there. Um I like that a lot as well. But it can't stand there, right? I can't just, you know, write it all down and then think it's done. I need to have the interaction yes, about it. Upload it on the internet. Uh, exactly. Let the magic happen. Exactly. Now that you know how to work with me, let's go. <laughs> yeah, which brings us back to the topic of agency and responsibility. Right? Yeah, exactly. Wow. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Miriam. We've spoken for, yeah, almost one and a half hours. Is there anything that you would have wanted to share, but we didn't? I'm aware that <laughs> that there were a lot of topics that we intended to. Let's talk look about. at the parking lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is there anything that you wanted to to share with me in the audience before we part? Nothing comes to mind that we we haven't touched on anyway. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Time flies when you're when you're having a good conversation. So. Thank you. I will put the, your contact details and how to reach you in the show notes. Perfect. Thank you. Radical inclusion. <laughs> Radical inclusion. Dum, da, da, dum.